thank you for being with us and um, thank you very much, D. Joe, and thank you to all our friends for being here. Um, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. I'm, I'm delighted and I'm privileged to be here. So I'm MG Michael and I'd like to welcome you to the first part of our presentation. Ubervalence can be defined as an omnipresent electronic surveillance facilitated by technology that makes it possible to embed surveillance devices into the human body. These embedded technologies can take the form of traditional pacemakers, RFID tag and transponder implants, smart swallowable pills, nanotechnology patches, multi-electrode array brain implants, and even smart dust, and this is only to mention but a few form factors. Ubervalence has to do with the fundamental who, someone's identity, where, someone's location, and when, i.e. timestamps, in an attempt to derive motivation, what, the result, and even the how, the method, the plan, and increasingly the thought. Ubervalence can be a predictive mechanism for a person's expected behavior, traits, likes, or dislikes, based on historical fact, or it can be about real-time measurement and observation, or it can be something in between. The inherent problem with urbivalence is that facts do not always add up to truth, as contradictory as that might sound. And predictions or interpretations based on urbivalence are not always correct, even if there is direct visual evidence available. In a longer presentation, I would have defended that statement by making reference to context, which is invisible to the naked eye. So ubervalence cannot know the soul. So it will become increasingly aggressive and intrusive. Ubervalence is more than CCTV feeds or cross-agency databases linked to national identity cards or biometrics and e-passports used for international travel. Ubervalence is the sum total, it's the summa of all these types of surveillance and the deliberate integration of individuals' personal data for the continuous tracking and monitoring of identity, location, and point of view in real time. In its ultimate form, Ubervalence has to do with more than automatic identification and location-based technologies that we carry with us. It has to do with an under-the-skin technology that is embedded in the body, such as microchip implants. And of course, that technology is continually evolving. Think of it as Big Brother on the inside looking out. It is like a black box embedded in the body, in the body which records and gathers evidence. And in this instance, transmitting specific measures wirelessly back to base. This implant is virtually meaningless without the hybrid network architecture that supports its functionality, making the person a walking online node. We are referring here to the lowest common denominator in the definition, the smallest unit of tracking, presently a tiny chip inside the body of a human being or an animal or, or a thing. But it should be stated that electronic tattoos and nano patches that are worn on the body can also certainly be considered mechanisms for data collection in the future. Whether wearable or bearable or even insertable, it is the intended objective which remains important. It is the notion of people as sensors the gradual emergence of the so-called human cloud, that cloud computing platform which allows for the interworking of human points of view using wearable recording technology will also be a major factor in the proactive profiling of individuals. Data valence conceived by Roger Clark of the Australian National University in 1988, is the systematic use of personal data systems 
in the investigation or monitoring of the actions or communications of one or more persons. And according to the Oxford Dictionary, data violence is summarized as the practice of monitoring the online activity of a person or a group. It is hard to believe that this term, data violence, was introduced a quarter of a century ago in response to our government's agency, to, our, to government agency here in Australia, that sought to data match initiatives linking taxation records and social security benefits, among other commercial data mining practices. At the time, it was a powerful statement in response to the Australia Card proposal in 1987, which was never implemented despite attempts to introduce an access card almost two decades later in 2005. The same issues ensure today, only on a more momentous magnitude with far more consequences and advanced capabilities in analytics, data storage, and converging systems. The implications are, are, are extremely more severe given the ubiquity of these surveillance technologies. Surveillance, conceived by Steve Mann of the University of Toronto in 2002, but practiced since at least 1995, is the recording of an activity from the perspective of a participant in, the, in that activity. However, its initial introduction into the literature came in the inaugural publication of the Surveillance and Society Journal in 2003 with a meaning of inverse surveillance as a counter to organizational surveillance. Friedman prefers to interpret surveillance as undersight, which maintains integrity, contra to surveillance as oversight, which equates to hypocrisy and where there is not an equal relationship between the observer and the observed. Whereas data violence is the systematic use of personal data systems in monitoring people, surveillance is the inverse of monitoring people. It is a continuous capture of personal experience. For example, data violence might include the linking of someone's tax file number with their bank account details and communications data. Surveillance, on the other hand, is a voluntary act of logging, even logging one's own life continually with what one might see around them as they move through the world. Of course, that raises other privacy implications. To what extent do I want to be involved in another's life logging experiment or collection or biography? So the, all these implications that arise from these intrusive surveillance technologies. Surveillance is thus considered watching from above, whereas surveillance is considered watching from below. In contrast, that of violence is the monitoring of a person's online activities, which presents the individual with numerous social dangers. I conceived of uberveillance in a postgraduate class I delivered at the University of Wollongong in 2006. Today, now, I did this after being prompted by my marvelous students to describe what I felt was happening with these intrusive surveillance technologies. And I, I could not think of a term or a word that adequately expressed what I was feeling or seeing. Big Brother didn't quite cut it for me. I wanted something that internalized the surveillance and um, violence came to my mind, which um, had a, a history in my thinking going back to literature, to philosophy, and my reading of apocalyptic literature. And I've documented, documented all that in other papers, if you're interested. So there was certainly a background to how the term dropped in that day, a whole history. So today it is commonly defined as ubiquitous or pervasive electronic surveillance that is not only always on, but always with you, ultimately in the form of bodily invasive surveillance. The term itself entered the Macquarie Dictionary of Australia officially in 2008. And I was happy to see very close to how I had originally defined it. So I was happy with the result here. So it's defined as an omnipresent electronic surveillance 
facilitated by technology that makes it possible to embed surveillance devices in the human body. I was particularly happy that the definition allowed for some elasticity to the definition, allowing for new innovations and new technologies which were aligned or married to surveillance technology. The concern over ribovalence is directly related to the misinformation, misinterpretation, and information manipulation of citizens' data. That is, we can strive for omnipresence through real-time remote sharing and monitoring, but we will never and can never achieve simple omniscience. And this is why these technologies will become more aggressive as they try to reach that, that divinity, if I can call it that, but it just can't happen because that would mean depth charging into the soul. And that's why I made that distinction between um, truth and facts and the importance of context. Übervalence is a compound word conjoining the German uber, meaning over or above. <laughs> the French um, valence, which more literally translated means is watchfulness. The concept is very much li linked to Nietzsche's vision of the Ubermensch, who is a man with powers beyond those of an ordinary human being, like a superman with amplified abilities. And this is how we are hoping to evolve our technology, to make it a super technology with amplified ability. So my connection with um, Nietzsche's Ubermensch um, is a closely linked one. So Ubervalence is analogous to, oh, the irony there, of course, in the, in the definition is that um, Ubervalence itself wants to present itself as a, an, an omniscient device, an omniscient system, but it carries within it the inherent contradictions that it can be manipulated by various agents um, to create the misinformation, the misinterpretation and information manipulation. So there is a fallacy and there is a, a false comfort in this technology. Um, perhaps you may call it fake news. That's, uh, we can look at it in that context. So the more, the more we think we have an infallible source, the more we can manipulate it to make people think actually the information we're given is infallible. But the truth is it can be greatly manipulated and used in, in ways which the information was never intended. So ubervalence is analogous to embedded devices that quantify the self and measure indiscriminately. For example, heart, pulse and temperature, sensor readings emanating from the body in binary bits wirelessly, or even through amplified eyes, such as inserted contact lens, lens glass that might provide visual display and access to the internet or social networking applications. Ubervalence brings together all forms of watching from above and from below, from machines that move to those that stand still, from animals and from people, acquired involuntarily or voluntarily, voluntarily using obtrusive or unobtrusive devices. The smaller the surveillance device, the more dangerous or the more um, amplified its use can be and uh, eroding even further our, our want, our need, the importance of privacy. And sometimes because we can't see it, we think it cannot affect us. Another irony in that. Um, the network infrastructure underlies the ability to collect big data analytics and ensures an interpretation of the unique behavioral traits of the individual, implying more than just predicted movement but trying to imply or to suggest intent and thought. It has been said that ubervalence is that part of the valence puzzle that brings together the sud, the data and the su to an intersecting point. In ubervalence, there is the watching from above component, su. There is the collecting of personal data and public data for mining data. And there is the watching from below, su, which can draw together social networks, strangers, all coming together via wearable and implantable devices on or in the human body. Ubervalence can be used for good, but we contend that independent of its application for non-medical purposes, it will always have an underlying control factor of power and, and authority. And these are the the, the questions, the implications uh, that 
define our work and our research to try to come to some sort of understanding of how we can be used, what are the dangers, and how we can publicly share and analyze these dangers for the public and with our colleagues.